Well, good morning, everybody. It is a pleasure and a privilege for me to introduce our speaker of today, Professor Carl Christon. Difficult to summarize his uh, trajectory, but I at least will mention some of his aspects that uh, need to be highlighted. He studied physics and psychology in the Cambridge University, but then he completed his study in the King's College Hospital uh, in medicine and later specialized in the Oxford University in Sydney. He has many contributions to neuroscience, but it is worth to highlight some of them. For instance, uh, he invented the statistical parametric mapping, which is an international standard for image uh, data analysis. The voxel based morphometry, a technique that detects differences in neural anatomy and is used clinically as well as in genetic studies. He invented the dynamic causal modeling, which is used to infer that like the brain. He has mathematical contribution and dynamic expectation maximization, which for time series analysis. He currently the human brain and the principles that underlie contribution to genetic and uh, neurobiology. <coughs> in 1996, he received the first Young Investigation Investigator Award, selected fellow of the Academy in, of Medicine, Science of Medical Science in 1999, in recognition of contribution to the biomedical sciences. In the year 2000, he was president of the International Organization of Human Brain Mapping. In 2003, he received the Minerva Golden Brain Award and was elected Fellow of the Royal Society in 2006. He received the Collège de France Medal in 2008. In 2011, he received an honorary doctorate from the University of York and became Fellow of the Society of Biology. And also in the, in the, at the University of College in London, but also scientific director of the Wellcome Trust for a uh, Center for Neuroimaging. So, Carl, it's a pleasure to have you here, and thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. You have a lovely setup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a truly impressive <coughs> um, organization to have here. I should start with um, an apology. Um, I'm going to show some simulations, but I'll be looking at your simulations. I think that my simulations are very childlike. <laughs> Bear in mind, I only have a lab, a very small personal computer, and I can only do these simulations on a Sunday. So uh, please forgive uh, the quality in relation to some of the simulations that you do, um, self-organization and generalized synchrony. Um, so what I'm going to do today um, is work towards simulations of brain-like behavior in terms of action and perception. And I'm going to set ourselves the challenge of deriving the basic principles of the dynamics that underlie action and perception. Uh, so I'm going to start off with some, uh, a very abstract formulation of what it is to possess life-like dynamics and behavior and then work from those basic principles to try and understand those principles in action uh, in the brain itself. So let me just overview for you the talk. We're going to start off with the statistics of life. And I'm going to emphasize two things. The uh, ergodic properties of to study or biological life systems are the focus of uh, much of the work in this institute. Uh, but more importantly, the, um, the role of Markov blankets in trying to organize the exchange between internal and external states, and indeed the role of a Markov blanket in defining the system and the boundaries to the system. So that's the idea that I'm going to bring to the table to try and understand uh, the nature of dynamics. And I'm going to illustrate the role of Markov blankets uh, through these rather primitive simulations of, of the primordial soup. And then using the um, underlying 
principles and behaviors and we'll translate them into neuronal dynamics and try to understand those principles in terms of the brain as a, a statistical organ, uh, a machine which generates predictions, makes inferences about the causes of its sensory inputs. And this is, uh, as we will see, this is very much based upon the ideas of Helmholtz um, and notions of unconscious inference, basically trying to uh, explain what caused sensory impressions by testing hypotheses or models about how the world is working and generating sensations against sensory evidence. Um, and we'll appeal here to graphical models that are embodied by the brain itself and the process of making inferences about the causes of sensations as implemented by a particular form of uh, inference predictive coding and see what that has to say about the anatomy and physiology of chronicle microcircuits in the brain. And having established these sort of basic uh, ideas with some simple simulations of action and perception, and I'm going to focus on uh, perceptual responses to emissions. Um, and I'll explain why that's important uh, when we get that far. And then close with simulations of action and observing action. So try and get us uh, to quite some quite high level aspects of cognitive neuroscience, such as uh, uh, sort of mirror neurons and theory of mind, but keeping uh, the faith in terms of this sort of translation of basic principles right through to an understanding of uh, brain organization and brain processing. Um, now, I'm not. Um, and also, I'm reassured by the fact that you are probably more expert in any of the concepts that I'm going to talk about than I am. So, if we come across something that, you, that no one else knows, somebody doesn't know the audience, I, I'm going to ask somebody who does know to explain it to them. So, if, is that okay? We do it sort of uh, in, 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 in an interactive way. Is that, would that be all right? Uh, please feel free to interrupt me uh, if you want uh, to ask questions. But if we do that, I can guarantee you we won't have time to finish the talk. But it doesn't mean that. <laughs> right, so this is where I want to start. An odd place, but um, we'll see why. Schrodinger, how can the events in space and time which take place within the spatial boundary of a living organism be... Now, we're not going to answer highlight the of that question. So there's actually how does a spatial boundary arise? Does that boundary maintain itself? Does it persist in an ergodic sense over its the spatial boundary? I'm trying to characterize of the existence of that boundary. So, Schrodinger would be the first person to acknowledge is a probabilistic entity. And the analysis of causal systems, the mark of blanket. So, let me ask my first question. Who knows what? No one knows what mark of black. I'd rather hope to get that person. Well, I, I will explain what a mark of blanket is, and then you can do just. So, a mark of blanket is effectively a statistical boundary. A set of states. Let's just take this sort of um, Bayes net. Each of these nodes represents some hidden state or some state. Are denoted by the edges or arrows here. So this state on that state. Now, uh, if I were to, for example, this state here, and I will refer to the boundary of the Markov blanket, a statistical sense insulate that. 
that I'm going to call external states. So by insulating or um, enshrouding to predict the internal states that it, um, is happening in the universe. I would of my Markov blanket. I would not need to learn nothing more by observing this state if I already knew this state. And in fact, Markov blanket. So it's a statistical concept that I repeat um, provides a, um, an insulate, a statistical insulation in the sense of conditional independences. Uh, you may well be familiar with this in terms of a Markov chain or a Markovian process. So for a Markov, Markov chain, you only need to know the preceding state. You don't need to go any deeper in the history. Everything you need to know is contained in a statistical sense in the, in the preceding state in relation to the current state. So this is just a generalization of that concept. I'm going to make a further partition on the Markov blanket that is in terms of the parents and the children and the parents of the children of the internal states. And I'm going to note that there are some states that depend upon the internal states and some of the Markov blanket and some uh, Markov blanket states that do not depend upon the internal states. I'm going to make um, a somewhat arbitrary bipartition of the Markov blanket into states that do and do not depend upon the internal states. And they are um, almost universally, uh, both of those uh, subsets in that partition have to exist. So for any system, there will be a Markov blanket, and any Markov blanket uh, sensory states and active states. And you sensory states and active states. Uh, I'm going to motivate that by to think about that four-way partition of all states from the point of view of an organism that has some form of boundary. An organism can be a simple organism, say a single cell, right through to the brain. So for example, in a single cell, I can associate the internal states with all the all the intracellular components, the active states, can be associated with the active filaments, the, um, the infrastructure that gives the cell its motility and supports the sensory states or the surface states that are exposed to the external states of the environment. And if we follow through those edges or those uh, statistical <coughs> dependencies, you will see that they conform exactly to the, uh, the construction of the Markov blanket and the, uh, and the partition that I've just described. And exactly the same. Um, statistical dependency can be applied to brain states. So we can consider all the neuronal activity, the synaptic activity, synaptic efficacies, <coughs> anything, any attribute that we would need to list in order to say this is the state of the brain at this point in time. We can call those internal states. And these internal states are driving active states, our effector organs, our secretory systems, our uh, striated muscle that themselves support the sensory epithelia that we use, uh, the sensory states that we use to sample the external states in the world. And again, if one follows through the conditional dependencies, what influences what, we again arrive at this very simple structure with internal states, Markov blanket, and external states with a bipartition of the Markov blanket itself. Uh, you'll notice here that I've um, describe the dynamics of, of these states in terms of a, uh, a flow or um, fun a, a function of uh, the states uh, that also uh, encode the dependencies that I've just described. So for example, we see here that the action is not a function of external states, whereas the sensory states are not a function of the internal states here. And the job is really to, to see how far we can get in understanding the form and the nature of these equations of motion. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do now is forget about the Markov blankets, and we're just going to look at some of the fundamentals of dynamics of ergodic systems. 
and then what we're going to do is put the mark of blanket back in again and see what that in, what that implies. Implications of the very existence of a mark of blanket. But let me just back up. Let me just invite you now to think about a state space representation of any system that is agonic in the sense that any measure on that system will converge to some number if I observe it for long enough. And what that means is that that there is some attracting set of states that uh, contain the trajectory of uh, or path through state space, say two states here, um, and the system is evolved by tracing out a path or trajectory in the state space here. And I can associate, if I observe it for long enough, under the ergodic assumption, the density of those paths with the ergodic density. Um, that would normally be described by uh, the, um, the Fokker Planck. Uh, so, is everybody familiar with the Fokker Planck equation? Who knows, who knows about the Fokker Planck equation? <laughs> ah, good, right. So, who doesn't know about the Fokker Planck equation? Right, so can you describe to the <laughs> what the Fokker Planck equation? Well, you know also about the Fokker Planck equation? <laughs> Equation. So here's the differential equation. Here's a stochastic bit, the random fluctuations omega here. And this um, exactly is a description of how that density, so if we imagine the density of this, um, these uh, uh, trajectories through state space here encoding a probability density over the states, then we can write down the Fokker Planck equation, which just describes a rate of change of that probability density as a function of the determinism in that trajectory <coughs> and the amplitude of the random fluctuations omega here, which I'm denoting by gamma. So, uh, for those of you who don't know about it's not terribly important. It's just sufficient to know that we can write down not how the state or the system evolves, but how the probability distribution of the system will evolve over time. And notice we've converted a stochastic differential <coughs> equation into an ordinary or different uh, determinative differential equation because we're now talking about the probabilistic evolution of uh, this like ensemble um, of, uh, of particles that are flowing around in the state space here. Now, of the system um, that is conserved over time, then we are assuming that it has this attracting state form, it has a random verbal attractor that has, is equipped with this um, ergodic density that is the solution to the fokker planck equation. So when this is zero, then the probability distribution describes the behavior of the system on average. Uh, form here, um, constraints on or express the flow of the system in terms of the ergodic density itself, about the gradients of the ergodic density. And it's this equation which is quite important. So uh, I just want to sort of unpack this equation here. Um, I'm using or appealing here to Helmholtz's uh, decomposition just to say that we can once the system has settled down to its uh, attracting set, then the solution to the Fokker Planck equation means that we can always express the flow on this manifold here in terms of two components. One component is a hill climbing component, and it's a hill climbing component that ascends the log of the component. If the system is always trying to flow towards regimes of higher occupancy get back to where it thinks it should normally, uh, states that it would normally occupy on average. And then the other component is a, um, a solenoidal component that's uh, orthogonal to or right angles to this hill was the probability density or the ergodic density. One component's trying to flow uphill base of the hill uh, without actually affecting the probability itself. It's like a circular 
well, it's acute as well, and so on. So that must be true. That is the, that must be true for any system that has attained an attracting set and is a log. If that's the case, I mean, if this set of states X can be partitioned into a Markov blanket, and so this is this is the important thing. What I'm going to do now is take this very general expression for flow and decompose it in terms of the Markov blanket and see what happens. And what happens um, is quite remarkable. What I've done the internal states and the active states in the form of that generalized, if you like, circuitous gradient descent, <coughs> in the you like that. Now. But because these two things can't see the external states, they do, they do not appear in the left hand side. And yet this equation still holds true, it still has to hold. What this means is that the motion of the internal states and the, act, uh, the active will appear to have averaged out external states. They will appear to behave as if they knew external states, but of course they can't see the external So there's something quite, uh, I'd say, almost magical. The internal and the active states, and yet they can't see them. And that interesting behavior by many, many people and uh, are concepts behind it. Right. Under this simple imperative or this simple uh, consequence of any system possessing a Markov blanket. So let me just take you through on this uh, circuit equation of motion here. This quantity here probability of um, particular conditioned upon any um, um, sort of system, say for example. Uh, if we consider this as occupied, so when the probability of me occupying the state is high, that's valuable for me because I like to occupy that state. I like to be in that state. Then what we're saying is that our internal states and our action are always trying to increase value. So operationally, I'm just saying the valuable states and the states that mean the sort of I'll be warm, happy, fed, and I will aspire to, through my reorganization of internal states and my action, always increase that through this necessary hill climbing. One can develop that perspective and understand a lot of reinforcement and even in the context of economics and behavioral economics, in terms of behaving, choosing, acting. Now, that quantity here, value, the log probability, if I just put a minus sign on it, it becomes self information from the point of view of information theory. I'm going to call it uh, uh, that is also refers to it as surprise and incidentally. Approximation to surprise. So it's a self information. So, surprise about a violation or, um, uh, or uh, finding myself in a state that I do not normally occupy. So, <clears throat> what we're saying here is to minimize their surprise and then one can unpack that statement or that, that, that imperative using information theory. And what one arrives at a whole series of Principles, principles of maximum efficiency, the infamax or maximum mutual information principle, uh, the principle of minimum redundancy um, proposed by Horace Barlow um, in the compelling, very compact descriptions basically of this dynamic <coughs> here, when formulated not in terms of value but in terms of surprise um, or self information. The 
time average, because of the ergodic assumption of surprise, so this is a simple surprise, this is not Bayesian surprise. Yeah. <coughs> the time average of the uh, surprise is just the entropy, the Shannon entropy, and the relative entropy then will become a Bayesian surprise. Um, so what we're also saying is time implicitly <coughs> Over time, we're also trying to minimize the time average, or we're trying to suppress the Shannon entropy. And of course, that's the holy grail of much of cybernetics, synergetics, self organization, and homeostasis. In fact, there's nothing more than homeostasis. It's just we're trying to minimize the dispersion of our sensory states, we're trying to um, uh, keep our states within bounds that necessarily puts a limit on the natural tendency of these random fluctuations to disperse our space. There's a principled explanation for what a lot of uh, self organization <coughs> um, uh, tries to explain explicitly in terms of this notion of a homeostat. The whole purpose which is inevitably an apparent consequence of this circuitous hill climbing uh, um, dynamic up here. And then finally, this quantity here, the probability of some sensory data given me. But if I can inter interpret me now as a model, then I've got a conditional probability of sensory data given a model. Now in statistics, that's known as the, um, the evidence, and this is the log of evidence. And this is the quantity that every statistician, every analyst of any data will always try to maximize. Anybody who wants to evaluate one model of our hypothesis in relation to the ratio of this model evidence or um, in log space or log odds ratio or a base factor, which means that we can also interpret this um, circuitous um, hill climbing uh, dynamic as an implicit expression of Bayesian model, Bayesian inference, because we're always trying to maximize the Bayesian model evidence. In the, very, the physics of the system in question. And that perspective leads us to the, the Bayesian brain I repeat, uh, initially um, uh, described um, conceptually by people like Helmel, so lots of people before him, but he was probably this notion. So I just want to um, illustrate the nature of the of this self-organization and the magic uh, of, the, of Mark of Blanket. And this is the bit I was apologizing for <coughs> before. So this is my attempt at a uh, at that self-organized uh, simulating self-organization. Uh, so what I did here was uh, create 128 little macromolecules and equipped these little macromolecules with um, intrinsic electrochemical dynamics basically using the equations of motion from the Lorentz factor. So they have three electrochemical states. And then I put them in some metric space and, and then gave them Newtonian repulsive and attractive short range forces that uh, depended upon their electrochemical status. It doesn't matter how I did that completely arbitrary because in principle anything will do here. Um, the important thing is going to be the mark of blanket. So I was just trying to get some endogenic, some rich behavior um, using these uh, little Lorentz macromolecules here with strong local repulsion and uh, weak electrochemical attraction that was state dependent. And then molecules, the color here corresponds to their electrochemical state uh, and their location corresponds to their Newtonian state or the position here, the dynamics, electrochemical, and the motion here. <coughs> illustrating that after about 150 seconds, it sort of settles down to an equilibrium steady state, with uh, which, uh, despite these sort of little catastrophes, is uh, can be uh, largely considered uh, ergodic. So with that system, I now the game would be now to go in. see behaviors that speak to the, the four interpretations that I just gave you of the flow of any 
it since then. That possesses a mark on the blanket. And if you remember, I want to really focus on this sort of um, um, self coin in terms of uh, uh, umbrellas uh, or to uh, So, in terms of minimizing the dispersion of states, that implies that I'm um, that action is going to be obtained the functional and structural integrity <coughs> of this, the boundary <coughs> of this system, um, namely its Markov blanket. And from the point of view of the Bayesian interpretation, then I will be uh, looking for evidence that the internal states are in some way Bayesian modelers or predictors of the external states. And I'm going to refer to that as active influence. So these are the, sort of the two characteristic behaviors that I would expect to see if I were able to identify the Markov blanket, identifying the Markov blanket in this simulated primordial soup. If I can do that, then I, can, then I have identified the internal states, and then I can ask questions about the Markov blanket of those internal states. Do they show an autopoiesis? Do the internal states infer or represent the external states in some meaningful sense? So the first thing is to identify the Markov I've written down the equations of motion that created the system, I know the dependency structure. If I know the dependency structure, I know its adjacency matrix, and I know the adjacency matrix. It's almost trivial. Uh, that identification involves the, uh, the parents, the children, and the parents of the children. I then have, uh, I then just identify the um, eigenvector of that mark of blanket forming operator to identify the blue states here, which are the internal states here. This is the adjacency matrix. We don't need Here's the same schematic as before, but now I've color-coded internal states, the little ring structure here, the little cilium or tail here, the active states, which are supporting the uh, sensory states or the surface states on the outside. So the blue and the purple are the mark of blanket, and everything else are the external states here. And now we can observe, buried in this um, primordial soup, a little organism that is defined by its Markov blanket. And now I can start to do experiments on that. I would do on my subjects in my neuroscience lab. I can do stimulation, um, look for correlations, neural correlates, and some certain events, so I can do lesion experiments. In fact, I'm going to do lesion experiments to address the uh, autopoetic aspect of this. If it is the case that the integrity of the Markov blanket depends upon the between active and sensory states implicit in the Markov blanket and the intrinsic responses of the external states, that means that lesioning any should destroy the Markov blanket. And that's what this slide um, is showing. Oops, sorry. This slide is showing here. So, over a period of 512 seconds <coughs> of the internal states in their mark of blanket here, leaving the system intact. So it's just responding to perturbations from the external states and reciprocating through uh, the active states, um, the red states here. These three panels here is selectively the internal space, and it's a pretty mild lesion. All I've done is render to the electrochemical status of other spaces. It's, it's not a, I'm not destroying their motion or fixing them. I'm just decoupling them in terms of their sensitivity to the electrochemical status of their neighbors. Uh, so if I lesion the active states, I'm paralyzing the organism. I'm making the organism blind or deaf, or I'm giving it a stroke by lesioning the internal states. And in every instance, what one sees um, is a decay, a disintegration, a loss of integrity in the market market. And I've essentially destroyed or killed this little organism in one of the ways, but they, they all die. Um, that's not upsetting, is it? I, I upset one of my postdocs who has been very cruel. <laughs> Killing them, but they're just simulations. Um, 
So I'm just using this as a heuristic <coughs> illustration of, of what neuropsychologists do. There is a study brain damage or you know, people uh, with selective deficits to understand and in this instance, that impairment is a complete structural integrity of the boundary that defines me or uh, system. So let me now just turn um, to perspective. What I've been looking for here an encoding of the external status by the there's an implicit maximization and dynamics of the internal states, then I should be able to preempt an analysis of sensory fluctuations, which are, of course, the dynamics of the external states. So that means that the, I should be able to predict the motion, the physical Euclidean motion of some external states, knowing the electrochemical status of the internal states. So what I've done here is just use a very simple linear regression with some temporal embedding or lagging. Just to take a linear mixture of the past that will predict or could predict the movement of external states eventually uh, causing sensory impressions. Um, and the degree of predictability is color coded by the intensity of these cyan external states here. And interestingly, the, the ones that can be predicted best are those that lie on the periphery, furthest away from the organism. And in fact, the explanation is quite true. It's just the external states on the edge of the little blob of soup can move more, so there's more to predict. That's the explanation for this. The one that can be predicted uh, most easily is this one here. I've just taken a, a segment just to show you um, the accuracy of this prediction, so that there the are solid and dotted lines here. The solid line is the um, prediction of the movement. This um, macromolecule molecule here, based on the prediction, is this based upon the electrochemical state of these here. And you can see a, a good predictability or an accurate predictability is the fact that the transient that predicts movement, some sort of jump in this uh, seeds and um, and lives the event itself. So there's an open question here whether really these internal states are predicting the external states, or the external states are predicting the internal states. There's actually a circularity here, which this particular portrayal of active inference is not resolved. But I, I, I want to actually not just acknowledge and almost celebrate that and, and um, just notice that all that's been done here is um, uh, to exploit um, uh, a one perspective on generalized synchrony between the internal and the external states because they are a significant couple. Uh, so generalized synchrony, who knows what generalized synchrony is? Yeah, I know, you know. Right. Silly question. Who doesn't know what generalized synchrony is? Well, that's all. That's all. From the point of view, then, of uh, generalized synchronization, what we can assume is, so outside this cartoon here, being the, one of the original drawings with the uh, coupled um, um, uh, uh, pendulum clocks here, uh, suspended from a common beam, um, from the statistics, what we can say is that the internal states are one or another clock or clocks, and the Markov blanket is the common substrate um, that couples them in, 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 a, in, a, in a loose sense or in a precarious sense here, the beam that suspends both of the clocks and eventually come to swing in synchrony. This sort, of, this sort of generalized symphony perspective states are trying to infer the external states because of this exact symmetry. The converse is also true, which means as fast as you're trying to infer your world, you have to be beware because the world is making inferences about you. It's watching you at the same time, which is <coughs> a, a, an interesting observation in the context of uh, embodied cognition and situated cognition. So that's the, 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 the sort of the, uh, 
the theoretical part, the abstract bit, what we've said is the existence of a Markov blanket necessarily implies a partition of states into internal states, a Markov blanket, namely sensory and active states, and external or states that are hidden from the internal states because uh, they can only be seen through the Markov blanket. And because active states change but are not changed by external states, they minimize the entropy of internal states in the Markov blanket, and this means an action will appear to maintain the structural and functional integrity of the Markov blanket, namely autopoiesis. At the same time, internal states are, are, will appear to infer the hidden causes of sensory states by maximizing Bayesian model evidence and influence those causes through action. I'm going to refer to that as active inputs. So these are just necessary <coughs> consequences of anything that exists in the sense that we, we have been talking about. So let's just look at the implications of that for an understanding of how the brain functions and generalized sympathy between neuronal dynamics and the external world that are coupled through the sensorium, which we play the role of a Markov blanket. May I ask you a question? Sure. Because you, you put a logic in equation to describe the system, then you go to the focal plan representation, yeah. look at the, at the steady state solution of that one to define some quantities that are of interest for you. Yeah. But then you went into, into some simulation of the dynamical system. And I don't see the link between the latest result with respect to the definition you made for the surprise or, or, or this other, or this other the, the free energy, these other quantities. Well, it, it's, um, when I did the numerical simulations, I waited until it had attained uh, okay. non equilibrium and steady state. So at that point, any particularization over time um, will conform to the average behavior described by the bottom point equation. So what I'm saying is that on average, the behaviors that I've illustrated are entirely consistent with the ensemble average behavior by virtue of the fact that I integrated into a non equilibrium and steady state. So and that's where the endogenic bit kicks in. This is sort of a, a weak endogenic assumption. I'm just assuming that these quantities exist, uh, or that they're, 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 they are measures that will converge um, with observations over time. So it's really the um, casting um, the problem in terms of trying to understand the behavior of systems that have attained non-equilibrium steady state, that have uh, converge to a random dynamic attractor. That is itself a, a stochastic process. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can do that in terms of the ensemble average or the average over multiple points in time. So the behaviors I, I shown were realizations that must be true if I were able to show those average uh, over an infinite number of, of observations. Mm -hmm. So it's really the ergodic at non equilibrium steady state behavior that I tried to get at. Something before that the prediction you can do um, on the external state is best for you know, the furthest away. Yeah. It is now for this system where you have basically a bounded external state, so you have less neighbors yeah. for the furthest um, yeah. um, external state, or is it just given by the distance? No, it, it, it's a form. It, it, it's just an artifact of the particular simulation so center. What do you mean for an unbounded system? What? For, yes. What the prediction? Uh, well, I think you'd have to do it. I mean, um, you know, again, look at the posters around around this building. You were, you were <laughs> fun. So, but that's the deep question. So, yeah, what 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 aspects of external space in the environment in which we are immersed? Because you infer um, the interchange between internal and external state, but this is a bound system. So, if you have a system where the the, the, the size of the external state is infinite compared to the internal state. Does this still hold? Yeah. Um, well, yes, in the sense that you can you can imagine um, sort of generalized synchrony being mediated by sort of waves and solitons in, in a sort of you know in a, in a, um, a system that has say periodic boundary conditions. Okay. And, you know, I think that clearly what would be predictable um, will depend upon the particular system in question. But, uh, in a sense. The answering that question is is is, is a, a about sort of fifty percent of neuroscience. It's basically what parts of the brain are specialised for detecting what sorts of events and where are they in relation to the sensory organs. Mm -hmm. So just trying to define functional specialisation of the brain. Trying to say there is a visual area, there is a motion area. What you are saying is that these are. Um, 
aspects of dynamics and, and causes in the external space that have become uh, relevant in terms of generalized sympathy to the internal and external space that are, in, that are integral to or necessary for the preservation of the market value. And clearly every species, and you know, every uh, spatial and temporal scale will have a different sort of pattern of general functional anatomy. So, you know, the question you ask me is one that you would have to, I think, pose to any expert any particular system that we're studying. I think one useful thing... <laughs> <laughs> uh, ...about is that, of course, there are a multitude of Markov blankets. So I've just shown you the, the principal Markov blanket shrouds the, the principal eigenvector of that Markov blanket um, uh, generating uh, matrix. Um, but there could be lots of other ones. Um, and furthermore, you can have Markov blankets within Markov blankets. So you could easily conceive of each cell having its own Markov blanket and exchanging with its sort of the neural or external, its external linear and having its own homeostasis. And then you get groups of cells, organs that will have their Markov blankets, you'll have a liver doing its thing, and then you have a phenotype, and then you'll have a, a whole group of conspecifics and then you can take it right up to the societal level. But at every point, as soon as you identify the mark of blanket or some boundary to the system that defines the system of study, then these dynamics have to be true. Mm -hmm. um, then it, I think, becomes again of understanding the particular, uh, the, you know, the particular anatomy of this truth for the system in question. Uh, but you could always, in principle, apply the sort of autopoetic or the active inference perspective to any system. So it is the case that, um, you know, a, at a societal level, you should be able to identify a mark of blanket around some constant <coughs> in that image. And they should implicitly be, uh, in their behavior, representing stuff on the outside or, or perturbations that are mediated by interactions through their sensory or surface space uh, from, from the outside. And if they didn't, they would fail to have the integrity that would be in generalized synchrony and harmony with the universe beyond. That could be unbounded. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I got horribly slowly. Perhaps I was, I was complacent and relaxed because I thought you would do it all, so I was going more slow than I should have been. Uh, so, uh, what I want to do now is uh, just tell exactly the same story, but from the point of view of a neuroscientist. Um, and emphasize the active influence side of things. So, although I know the story should be true from the point of view of dynamic systems, I now, in fact, pretend I didn't know that. What would it look like if I was a neuroscientist? And of course, what it would look like is that the brain is, I repeat, an organ of influence, an influence engine, a statistical engine that's, that's trying to maximize the evidence for its models of the world. And that's uh, most clearly articulated by Helmholtz here in that objects are always imagined as being present in the field of vision as would have to be there in order to produce the same impression on the nervous system. So what it's saying is that you perceive by having an explanation for the particular pattern of sensory states you encounter. And that explanation is a hypothesis that is based upon a forward model, a generative model, of what that cause in the external states in the environment would have to be in order to produce the same sensory data. So you're solving the inverse problem by actually putting a forward model inside your head and then using the sensory data to do the inverse problem. Uh, and that's very similar to notions of Richard Gregory that perception is hypothesis testing and you can extend that to say that active vision is actually experiments where you acquire the data to do the active, uh, to do the hypothesis testing. These ideas form, have been formalized in machine learning, particularly by people like Jeffrey Hinton, borrowing on variational techniques, variational free energy, uh, original device by Richard Feynman uh, in quantum physics, and cast in terms of probability theory uh, and using Thomas Bayes's iconic standard for probability theory here. Uh, and in particular, well, let me, let me just um, refer now to this nice phrase, produce the same impression on the nervous system. I think that's nice because it gives you, um, uh, it resonates nicely with the notion that Markov blanket is this sort of blanket or veil that enshrouds 
me uh, and separates me from the things causing those sensory impressions that are projected onto uh, the blanket or the veil. So my job is to guess what caused these sensory impressions or these shadows uh, here. That's what I am compelled to do if I am to exist and if I am to maintain uh, or my mark of blanket uh, uh, persists over time. So that's very, very close, of course, to uh, Plato's <coughs> So I said that Helmholtz was amongst the first to articulate that Plato had this idea. Uh, so, so do you all know Plato's cave? Well educated Mediterranean Catholic Scots. So I think now, ironically, I've run it so late, and you know I live in North Africa, it's very obvious. And so, the point being, of course, we've, we've ended up with exactly the same notion that the, the proletariat, the populace, only really perceive the shadows of the actors actually in the real world, in the external states themselves. They don't, they only perceive the shadows, not the, the reality. In exactly the same way, that all we have available to us are our sensory shadows or impressions um, that we receive through our sensory states. Um, I want to um, focus on predicted coding as, uh, as a particular formulation of this great concern because I think, um, at least as a heuristic or a metaphor, it's got a lot to say about how we can understand the message passing um, in the brain itself. So what I've done here is just write down the average um, flow or uh, motion of internal states in terms of our hill climbing, uh, simplifying it by eliminating the um, active and um, internal states here. Um, I can actually rewrite this um, uh, um, circuitous uh, gradient descent here in terms of the um, divergence free or solenoidal and hill climbing part proper. Uh, as a function of an auxiliary variable called prediction error. So these are the same equations. I've just written them down in a different way. And I'll explain in a moment what prediction error is. Um, I just wanted to say before that that you, many of you, by virtue of the way that I have labeled these two components in terms of a prediction and an update, will recognize this as, a, as the form of a Kalman filter. Does anybody recognize that? Does anybody not know what a Kalman filter is? Sorry, who doesn't know what Kalman filter is? Who does know what Kalman filter is? <laughs> That's illogical, isn't it? There are two people that have it and they don't know. Does anybody want to explain what Kalman filter is? Basic filter generally? No? It's effectively what you're doing with, if you put your, your stuff in, 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 uh, in prediction mode. So it's, it's, it's just a way of uh, online simulation of data where the objective is to estimate the hidden states of a process generating data observables. Mm. You know the form of the dynamics either in terms of the differential equation or a sort of uh, uh, some discrete update, holistic update maybe. And you know the mapping from the sensory uh, hidden states to the data. Uh, and what it, how it works is basically by predicting on the basis of, of the, uh, the past expectations the, or internal states encoding expectations new here, what you think the next hidden state of the world is going to be, and then correcting that prediction on the basis of a, um, a prediction error. Um, so you just have these two terms here, prediction and update term here. So what is the prediction error? Well, the prediction error um, is essentially just the difference between, so here we get to the bottleneck architecture and building that. So, so, um, so let's assume that we have this um, sensory shadow impression here. And we might have a hypothesis that this was caused by the shadow of a wolf. So we have this expectation here. So the hidden states are now standing in for, uh, or playing the role of sufficient statistics um, that encode uh, beliefs about the causes because they're inferring the external states. Here, for example, there's a wolf out there causing this particular sensory impression. So given my expectation there's a wolf and the expectations about illumination and the like, I would create this prediction of my sensory input. 
and I would compare it with the actual sensory input to uh, create a prediction error, which is just the sensory input, minus my prediction of, or the generation of that sensory input based upon my expectation of the causes of those, and that would be the prediction error. And all I have to do in order to maximize my model evidence is to minimize my prediction error. So this is a recasting really <coughs> problem. Uh, so the, the, the surprise is just the sum squared of the precision weighted prediction error, which is why <coughs> it's so important to estimate the precision. Because you can't do you can't do inference unless you estimate precision as well. Um, but that's a, that was a sort of side story. Uh, notice that the, um, it doesn't matter ever whether this expectation is actually true or not. As long as for your entire life you can minimize prediction error, you're doing good enough, you are a Bayesian modeler, you're a Bayesian engine, you will preserve your Markov blanket. So the actual cause of that sensory impression <laughs> does not have to be a wolf. <laughs> you would never know that. <laughs> um, so we, if, this predictive coding is just a device. And the predictive coding is just a particular formulation of, of this um, uh, more fundamental dynamic. Uh, but it's a useful one, uh, both heuristically and in terms of possibly understanding uh, message passing in the brain. And what we've done is just reduce the, um, the imperative not to some circuitous hill climbing um, expressed in terms of uh, solutions to the proper plan, but in terms of this simple job of minimizing prediction. And we can understand that in terms of action and perception very simply. So here's a prediction error that's caused by comparing sensations with top-down predictions of those sensations. And our job, or we will appear, it will appear as if our job is to minimize that prediction error. We can do that in one of two ways. We can either change our internal brain states to make the prediction better or uh, closer to the actual sensations, and we can call that changing of the internal states of perception, or we can actually resample the sensations to make them more like what we predicted, and we can call that action. And that's a complete, in principle, and sufficient account of action. It's simply moving to resample sensory input to make, it more what, to make it more like what you expected. So if you have predictions that you are a happy, fulfilled phenotype, and you move to sample data that confirms you are a happy, um, a functional phenotype, then you will be a happy and functional phenotype, and you will endure uh, indefinitely. Uh, so this perspective on action and perception, if you like, absorbs all those other reinforcement, maybe optimal motor control, uh, information theoretic, uh, self-organization, homeostat perspectives, it can all be reduced to the simple scheme of minimizing prediction error. And how might that work in the brain? Um, well, I referred before to the sort of the generation of predictions of sensory inputs um, as part of the formation of these auxiliary variables, the prediction errors. Um, and that, of course, speaks to the notion of a model that would generate those predictions. So this is the model that the Bayesian evidence applies to. And of course, it should recapitulate the actual causal structure in the external world. It doesn't have to, but it will be uh, more guaranteed to work than it did. And clearly that uh, causal structure is hierarchical. It has to be for its uh, separation of temporal scales uh, through all sorts of principles, uh, such a manifold theorem or uh, Swedish principle from synergetics. So we have this notion here that the the brain has a model where it thinks that the, core, the sensory inputs at the bottom are caused by slow fluctuations in hidden causes at the top that are subject to random fluctuations that excite dynamics um, and flows uh, amongst hidden states that themselves act as now um, causes or control variables for faster fluctuations. So you get this hierarchical composition of dynamical systems that right at the end, in very high dimension, produce, generate the sensory impressions that we have to now basically um, minimize the prediction error for, or because we're taking this Bayesian model in perspective, um, invert to get back to the causes. So this is the generative model, the forward model, generating consequences, sensory consequences from their causes. And now we're going to want to look at the brain as inverting, going back from the sensory consequences to infer the causes. So we want to invert this model. Um, here's a sort of more heuristic 
version of that notion. If I said to you, build me a generative model of the sort that um, you would see in a, a computer graphics or a, you know, a, one of the, a modern film that relies heavily on CGI. And I said to you, well, just build me a little model that generates realistic metatopic samples of, 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 of scanning object. The first thing you'd have to do is to write down the superordinate causes of the high, highest level. And then you dynamically and hierarchically unpack those in, in a consistent way to actually generate stimuli. So the first thing you have to do is, what are you looking at? How is it lit? Where are you looking at it? Where are you sampling? And you have to mix those in a very non-linear way to um, have a dynamic sort of trajectory or sampling of this space here. And then you would have to understand the nature of photoreceptors um, or limited sampling for the representations. And eventually, you would generate a prediction of sensory input here from the eyes to the nose as we move around here. The point being that this process is hierarchical. It requires very non-linear. Um, <coughs> And it is in the game of generating very low level representations that you would not immediately recognize as being this space. The job, of course, is to actually um, understand the minimization of prediction error so that you can actually recover this space and how it was sampled, the whatness and the awareness of uh, the causes of the sensory impressions from just the sensory data themselves. Um, and we can do that very simply just by. And uh, putting back our generalized hill climbing or our Kalman filter like uh, prediction and update scheme cast in terms of prediction errors. And the, the ensuing scheme looks very, very similar to the generative model, but we're just replacing the random fluctuations with prediction errors. But now the prediction errors do the backwards bit, they actually ascend the hierarchy and inform and nuance the expectations at each level to provide a better prediction by which we mean. The prediction, when generated in a top-down way, way, the predictions of the expectations at the lower level minimizes the prediction error. So all we're doing here is writing down the functional architecture of message passing implied by this scheme in the context of a hierarchical model. And that message passing can be simply understood as predictions that descend from expectations at any level of the hierarchy that are compared with expectations at the level below to form a prediction error. And the prediction errors are passed forward again to drive the expectations to minimize the prediction. So the prediction errors are self-canceling at every level of the hierarchy. So that once the thing settles down for any given stream of input, you now have a, a set of expectations at hierarchical or multiple levels of description that minimize prediction error at each and every level of description. So it's an internally consistent belief or expectation about the causes of sensory information that has multiple levels of description that are all accountable to, to each other. And this sort of message passing um, does actually have a lot of formal similarity with what we know about um, uh, the anatomy of um, cortical hierarchies and the asymmetries between forward and backward connections. Uh, I'll just briefly take you through this um, uh, which is a sort of more biological, uh, neurobiological take on that sort of scheme. So let's, for uh, example, consider the sorts of sensory information we would have from the eye. We could have retinotopic uh, visual information from the retina being passed forward to the lateral geniculus, top-down predictions from the visual cortex to form a prediction error. The prediction errors are sent back up to the visual cortex to make the expectations better to minimize the prediction error. But these um, expectations are themselves being predicted by top-down higher constructs or expectations to form a prediction error. And those prediction errors are sent back to revise the expectations at high level, and so on to any, high, uh, to any hierarchical depth that you wanted to consider. Now let's consider, that so that's would be a metaphor for perception, hierarchical based on perception based upon predictive coding that is entirely consistent with our generic hill climbing equation here. Let's consider the same game now, but now from the point of view of the other sort of sensory input, which is the stretch receptor or the proprioceptive input from the eye muscles. So now we have eye muscle stretch receptor signals. They're coming into the new cranial nerve nuclei in the pons here. 
they could be compared with top-down predictions to form a prediction error, and that prediction error could be set up to revise my values about where my eye is currently pointed. But these prediction errors are in a privileged role, uh, position, because they can couple directly back to the environment to actually drive the muscles to make the stretch receptor input exactly like what I predicted. So we're cancelling prediction error, not in the visual domain, but in the proprioceptive domain. We're making the world feel like I thought it should feel. But the world here is just about my beliefs about where my eye muscles were, well, not pointed, where they were pointed, but uh, how stretched they were or how they were actually moving. And what I've just described is nothing more than the classical reflex arc. And I think this is the thing that's doing the action. So it's, it's completely unmagical. It, so it's not, if you like, pointing your eyes to make the visual impressions you're expecting. You're not expecting to see a clock or a face. All you're expecting on the basis of, of this deep hierarchical processing on the sensory side is some particular configuration of your muscles. And it is those beliefs that can be fulfilled really simply just by reflex arts. So the visual processing certainly deeply informs the top-down predictions about where you look, but the enactment of those or the fulfillment of those predictions is actually needed to be very, very simply in the periphery, in the spinal cord, and the brain or the nuclei to minimize the proprioceptive uh, input. And with that simple, if you like, um, addition <coughs> of reflexes to predictive coding, we can actually explain a whole um, array of um, behavior uh, that's been formed through deep hierarchical inference uh, by perceptual processing. And I haven't got time because I'm now even starting later, I've gone over time, so I'm not going to show you the, the last. And the last part of the talk, I'll just um, go through like a movie. Uh, would have, if we'd had time, what we would have done is some very sweet. Can I just play the, the bird song? Just I like, I like the cheers me up my ears. So we were going to do perception. Can you hear that? We would have done um, hierarchical the language of bird chirps um, is constructed from <coughs> tractors and we would have put syntax on that and then we would have seen the, the violation responses when I omitted the final word in the sequence of different chirps and we would have seen that the absence of the stimulus produces bigger responses in the brain than the presence of an expected, uh, unexpected one uh, and we talked about that in terms of electrophysiology and then we use the same sort of ideas to put attractors and central pattern general, uh, well, fixed body attractors here to simulate Q region, region movements based on very simple prime beliefs about um, the um, uh, the consequent the, the consequences of changes in the sensorium for um, beliefs about the trajectory of the motor plant, uh, and we have used the same uh, device to uh, do more complicated examples, basically um, using heterogeneous cycles to prescribe handwriting uh, movements, um, and then we just uh, switched off the proprioceptive input by simulating the observation of somebody else doing handwriting and looked at the homologies and discussed those in terms of mirror neurons and then I would have concluded by saying that um, in fact just reading out a summary of what I uh, would, would have told you uh, which is beautifully summarized again by help us each movement we make by which we alter the appearance of objects should be thought of as an experiment designed to test whether we've understood correctly the invariant relations of the phenomena before us, that is, their existence in definite spatial relations. I would then thank all the people whose ideas I've been talk to, talking about, and then I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions or I will start with, uh, it looks that the, your theory is much more general than, than the one you apply to the brain, because you, you, you always refer to sensor input, you describe the brain and so on, but, but the, the theory is very general. Could you, for instance, apply just to a cell, to the body of a cell, not, yeah. not referring to, to, to the brain itself? Yeah. So the uh, colleague of mine, Stefan Kiebel, um, is 
jointly in Leipzig and Jena, uh, has applied the, 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 the sort of free energy version. I haven't really mentioned free energy. Free energy is um, in the same way that sort of simple surprise um, becomes the objective function that is based on moral evidence. Uh, and thereby minimizing or maximizing Bayesian moral evidence or minimizing surprise or becomes exact Bayesian inference. There's a whole parallel in that probably more important in terms of physically instantiated systems of approximate Bayesian inference where the objective function, the surprise or the, maxi- the, the moral evidence is replaced by a free energy bound on the moral evidence or surprise. And that's what you, that, that's what you, you, you minimize. Um, so he has applied the, free, uh, the principle of minimizing variational free energy um, to a single cell, and in particular, uh, dendrites. Mm-hmm. So here, the sensory states become the postsynaptic receptors, and the external states become the sequences of, of, of uh, neuronal impulses that that, that, that particular uh, dendrite will sense, and the action becomes the uh, expression or regression of various synapses. Uh, and then he basically uh, actually to optimize the precision and then removing um, synapses that see very imprecise input. He, he basically uh, optimizes free energy for that dendrite so that it comes to recognize particular sequences uh, and shows how that relates to equivalent results. I think that Michael has this group uh, in the CL, yeah, empirical, empirical results. So it, it certainly should and could be taken out of the single cell, but you know even the, from his point of view, compartments within a single cell. Uh, and you should be able to see exactly the same things going on. What other people in the social neurosciences are, are, are more than you know, what some of your colleagues are interested in. Exactly the same arguments. I, I, I sort of hinted at that. You can apply this to social exchange. So game theory, evolution, culture. If you can identify the mark of boundary of a conspecific conspecific sort of phenotype, um, then in principle exactly the same principles should should apply. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, to my knowledge, hasn't been done. Um, But in in principle, there's no reason why why it couldn't or shouldn't be done. Mm -hmm. You have a question? Yeah, I the way you interpret perception as coupled with action in all other internal external states reminds me of the old uh, ideas of a friend of mine, uh, Fabian Puster, who was then speaking of the perception action cycle. And not many people in the psychology field could understand very well why those two things should be coupled uh, all along the hierarchy in the small brain. But I mean, now you you need to describe that this coupling is is even down to the reflexes, and I I don't have to, I I assume, or up to the the whole hierarchy. Absolutely. I mean, you know, by virtue of the fact your sensory organs and your effector organs are right down the low level, everything above is necessarily both action and perception. It cannot be any other way. So that's interesting. I think Waki Fuster and um, Simon Haken. Do you know Simon Haken is an expert in uh, again Canada culture in Canada? So he's a, a mathematician. Um, and they've actually um, co-edited a special issue of IEEE called Cognitive Dynamics. So I, I, I know that because I had to review their paper very very fast. <laughs> <laughs> so so you know, there is, I think, a sort of interface community out there who, who appreciate um, Fuster's um, perspective and, and formalize it and are also embracing this sort of um, Bayesian filter, camera filter perspective on, on sort of uh, controlled theoretic problems. Um, it's also, I think, um, from my perspective, which is not quite uh, mainstream psychology, but I certainly get the sense that the, the anatomist embodied, situated, cognitive, uh, cognitive body, not the radical side, the non-radical um, embodied cognition people, they're, they're, they're now holding sway, that they're becoming more and more influential. More and more people now are thinking about the embodied you know, aspects of psychology. I mean, not the radical people, but the sort of more moderate, forgiving people. Do you know what I mean by radical embodiment? No? Oh, this is a deep joy yet to come there. <laughs> I'll preempt it by saying that, the, so you've all seen the famous um, illustration of uh, walking. Uh, from, from, so, um, 
you can devise artifacts that will just basically roll downhill that look as if they're walking just by using the, uh, the physical inertia of their parts. It's a little bit like Victorian toys that would roll downhill in, in an animal-like <laughs> fashion, yeah? So the, 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 the is it Rodney Brooks? I can't and anyway, people in robotics have taken this to the extreme. They've, they've developed um, robots that can do very realistic walking, as long as they're walking down the hill, with absolutely no control, no computer whatsoever. It's just the biomechanics and the way that they're built. And they are saying that this is a paradigm example of embodied cognition. There is no cognition. So these, this is a radical, but there are no representations. It's just what it is. That this particular system is so tuned in harmony with its unique niche that it does its generalized simply for free. You don't need to worry about any of this. So that would be the radical side, uh, you know, uh, which is not taken terribly seriously by the majority of people in the science, but uh, it is a more extreme view of the road towards uh, uh, coming back to the actual perception cycle. And of course, that goes right back to I would notice the road. So you know, right back to the sort of the road. Um, so, yeah, I'm with I'm with Foster on this one. Any other questions? Thanks again.